Welcome back. This is lecture, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> lecture 11, part 1. And let's return back to looking at the Eighth Commandment, where we're discussing the, the Eighth Commandment, which deals with the sanctity of property, that which belongs to another person. We're looking at thou shall not steal, you shall not steal, lo tigmaf. And we've been looking at the very specific nuances of this particular command. Now we've gone on and moved on, and we're looking at another section here this morning as we look at it in this particular class. And I want to draw your attention now to some of the more controversial issues that are dealt with in the modern era with regard to this particular commandment in the life of the church. And so I want to draw your attention to the book of Malachi chapter 3. If you'd be so kind to go to Malachi chapter 3. And let's look at verse 7, 8, and 9 together. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> We're looking at a scripture here. And the first thing we need to declare is that all acts of stealing are just simply wrong. Now, I realize that we live in an era, in a time, in an age, in an epoch, in a season where everybody seems to justify about everything that they can conceivably justify. But there is one form of stealing that is most serious and damning, and that is the one of robbing God. Now, I want to draw your attention to this because it is an, uh, it is an it is an often occurrence that takes place within the life of the church. And there is so many people in the life of the church who are stealing and robbing God and yet proclaiming to be that sons and daughters of God. And churches continue to allow this for fear because basically the pastorate, those who stand in the pulpit or those who rule, who govern over the church, fear more the people than they do of God. And, you were, and I want to draw your attention to this because in the book of Malachi, we're brought, God brings us to a point where he now is talking about purifying the church. And so look with me there. And the first point that I want to drive home is that a person robs God by failing to pay his tithes and offerings to God. That's what exactly what takes place. Now, I realize here's the controversy. A lot of people want to argue today whether we should just give offerings or we should pay tithes. Now, we can delineate that uh, quite easily in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. But it's such a convoluted issue today, and it's only convoluted because the pastorate, the pulpit, has had great fear in confronting the life of the church with regard to the truth of the Word of God. So let me make a bold statement here as we begin this particular section today. And that is that the issue is so convoluted today and that is simply is because the pulpit has not been willing to deal with the truth. The church is not willing to deal with the truth. Those, are, those who favor tithing or, uh, on one side are not honest about their tithing, and those who favor only giving on their side are not honest about their giving. And the fact of the matter is that it has been, le it's been lowered to a level of such a level of mediocrity, and yet we proclaim God's blessings upon us. God comes to a point with his people in Malachi where he chooses and he must make the decision to purify the church. In Malachi, he comes to this point in time, as we know it in the church today, and he comes to his people Israel at that time. And this is what he confronts Israel with. He says in Malachi chapter 3, studying in verse 1, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So notice this, that he says here, the messenger of the covenant, okay? and here, here we come here, so obviously he's coming He's coming as a messenger of the coming. In other words, he's coming as a messenger of the law is about to be applied here. And he says, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. 
He will sit as a smelter and purify of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Verse 4. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. Look what he says he's going to draw. It's for judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages. The widow and the orphan and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. So now here we have in verse 5 a clear delineation, a clear identification of all those whom judgment is going to come against. And if we're honest, that pretty much includes everybody here. Then he says in verse 6, he reminds him that he is who he is and he does not change. He says, for I, in verse 6, the Lord do not change. Therefore, you, O you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. So he tells him, I am who I am. I've been who I've always been and will continue to be who I always will continue to be. And because of that, my mercy, my grace has been with you in spite of the fact that you don't even realize it. Because had you had I changed, you would be dead by now. Then he says in verse seven, and now begin to look at this. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside. Okay? He says, you have turned aside, and, and he says, from my statutes, from my law, and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? So now they basically ask a question, okay? If I, if I can say it this way, it's basically a question of sheer stupidity on their part because these people have pretended to know the law. They have pretended to understand the covenant, and now they're going to act crazy and say, well, what, how do we come back to you? He just told them that they have been far from him, and he's commanding them to come back to him. It, it's a clear picture that they knew they were far from him, yet they asked acted like as though they did not know that. And so he says in verse 8, now he brings the situation into a very clear, crisp, specific statement. And he says in verse 8, will a man rob God? He's asking a question here. And he asks a rhetorical question which demands a response actually here. And he's telling them what they've done in a question. Yet you are robbing me, just in case they misunderstood him. He says, but you say, how have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? So you see, he anticipates all the knucklehead kinds of questions that are going to be asked of him. And he says in verse 9, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me and the whole nation of you. So he blankets the entire nation and tells them that they are lying to him. Now, here's what I said earlier to you. Point A, a person robs God by failing to pay his tithes and offerings to God. The controversy in the church today is that those who say, well, tithing is only for the Old Testament. And those say, well, giving is only for the New Testament. So depending on how you choose to rob God is going to pretty much depend on which side of the coin you're going to land on. Because if you choose tithing, then your tithing falls far short of what you should be giving. Because the truth of the matter is that if you bother to take the time to study out tithing in the Old Testament, you will discover that from Genesis to Malachi, it is not 10%. And in fact, it's going to be much more than that, that by the time the year ends, it's going to be somewhere around 30%. So all of a sudden, perhaps tithing doesn't appeal to you because man is always seeking to give the minimum in return for the maximum. So we brought in our politics and we brought in our economics from the world into the church seeking to sow the minimum in order to gain the maximum. And we love to do things like that and then sit there holy and thou in the congregation. And so you've discovered that if, in fact, you want to fall on the side of the coin of tithing, then you're going to have to realize that tithing is more than 
If you're going to fall on the side of giving, you're left in a quandary because the giving is never, is never, is never quantified for you, so you're always going to go to the lowest base possible in your mind, and usually your giving is reduced to somewhere around 10% anyway, since that's where you have chosen to fall, and since it is the beginning of at least the minimum of the tithe in the Old Testament. And so, stealing is something that is very profound and very widely practiced in the church of the living God. I can ask the congregation, would you invite a thief to your home? And almost exclusively, everyone tells me they would not do so. And I ask them, why? Because he is a thief. Yet, you enter God's house as a thief. You stay in God's house as a thief. You worship in God's house as a thief, and you leave God's house as a thief, and you're never ever truly transformed into what you're supposed to be. You get very spiritual when it comes to the issue of money. And the truth of the matter is that you are a thief. You steal from God. Point number two. A person robs God by living a hypocritical, inconsistent life. When a person professes to believe and follow God, then fails to follow through, he robs God and other men of godly testimony. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way. But when you rob God of a godly testimony, you are a thief. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says this. And here's where you begin to see, at least from a New Testament perspective, how much more broader this concept of you shall not steal truly exists in the life of the church, in the life of believers, as we begin to apply these Ten Commandments on a much more broader scale into the New Testament church, into the postmodern era. He says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6, <clears throat> in verse 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? Who, and he says, and that you are not your own. So here we have a clear declaration that you do not belong to yourself. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So you choose to do whatever you want with your body because that is the mantra of today where people tell you, well, it's my life, it's my body, I can do whatever I want with it. You are a fool. You do not belong unto yourself. And even those who say, I can do whatever I want with my life, it doesn't affect anybody. Yet when you die or you are injured severely right, or you are sick severely at the point of death, do not tell me that you do not affect other people. Yes, you do. You affect your friends and your loved ones grievously. They are grieving over the possible loss and the injurious acts that have taken place upon your person and your life. So that is nonsense. It's pure silliness on your part, and that is a lie, and you need to be called out on that. And basically, you make a statement like that because you don't want to be held accountable. You are stealing that which does not belong to you. Your body is not your body. Your body is a gift of God to you, but he is still the owner of it. So now I want you to note that. Point C. A person robs God by living for self and the world, by choosing not to live for God. God is the great creator of man, and therefore, oh, man owes his entire life to God and all he is and has to God. And when a person chooses to live like he wants, he steals his life from God. You don't have that right. You are not the creator of life. You, as I said to you previously, you do not own your own life. You belong to God. God is the creator. You are part of his creation. You belong to him. And when you choose to live a life, however which way you want to choose to live your life, okay, you commit one of the highest acts of blasphemy, which is now where creation tells the creator what to do, when to do, and how to do, because creation no longer needs creator. In the book of Romans, and we're told in the book of Romans in chapter 12, in verse 1 and 2, note the command and note this imperative and note this highly, highly important passage says, and the apostle Paul says, therefore I urge you, brethren, 
He says, by the mercies of God to present your bodies, he says, a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove that the, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So as we begin to look at these two verses in this scripture here, in this passage, we are told a lot of different things in here of which is expected of us. And he who chooses or she who chooses to live in the world and do whatever you want, whatever pleases, you are in direct violation of the word of God. He says here, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. That's exactly what God expects and nothing less. You are to present your life, your body, as a living and holy sacrifice to him, which is acceptable to God. And it says, which is your spiritual service of worship of which he commands and he demands worship on your part toward him with your life and with your body. And then he also says in verse 2, he tells us what not to do. And he says, do not be conformed to this world. And when you conform your life to this world, you are committing another act of blasphemy. You are committing another act, an injurious act against yourself because you insult the creator. And we are also told to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we're told what to do. You are to be transformed by the, renew of your, by the renewing of your mind. By what? By the word of God. And so many people who claim to be Christians and believers are really super duper spiritual, even though they're not biblical in their walk, but they claim to be spiritual, never take the time to read the scriptures. And the only possible conceivable way that you can do that is by renewing your mind by the word of God. Again, when you reject the word of God, you reject God himself. So that you may prove what the will of God is, we're told here in verse 2. So you are commanded here to prove what the will of God is. How? Because you have been given the capacity to do so. And that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. And 1 John chapter 2, and look with me in verse 15 and 16 as well. And don't lose sight of what we've been talking about. Because everything that we talked about here in Romans chapter 12 is you're stealing from God your life that doesn't belong to you. You belong to him. You are not the owner of your life. In 1 John chapter 2, we're told in verse 15 and 16, do not love the world nor the things in the world. So here's a command, you're told what not to do. And when you do so, you are stealing from God. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And when you love the world, the, the love of the Father is not in you because you have stolen his love by replacing it with the world. He says in verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're consuming that which is not of him. So you steal his place of glory, his place of honor in your life. He says, but it is from the world. So that is an act of stealing. Now I want you to think about this thought for a moment. F.B. Huey, F.B. Huey, um, has a comment about this that I want to draw your attention to. This commandment against stealing is broken when property is taken, no matter how little or in, and insignificant the item may be. F.B. Huey, again, has an excellent comment on the breaking of this commandment. Let me draw your attention to it. It says, the spirit of this commandment can be broken in ways other than taking the property of another violently or covertly. The employee who takes paper clips, who takes postage stamps, stationery, etc. from his employer for personal use, the taxpayer who falsifies his tax return, the friend who borrows money or even a cup of sugar without intent of returning it, the shopkeeper who uses dishonest scales and, and engages in any kind of fraudulent business practice, the student who takes credit for work that was done by someone else, the employee who loafs on the job but accepts full wages, or the nation that takes the land of another by war all violate this commandment. In other words, you are guilty. You are guilty. 
Let's be more clear than that. We are guilty. Never mind the world, I am speaking to all of those who find themselves within the confines of the family of the church of the living God. We violate this all the time. I speak to people all the time who are constantly stealing on their jobs and they claim that it is a blessing from the Lord. You don't work and you get paid. That's stealing. Let's be very clear about that. That is stealing. Maxie Dunham also has a great comment on this passage. And I want you to understand, look at his application. Note how he puts it together. One of the tra tragedies of our day is how the justice system treats crimes of stealing. Poor people with no money to hire legal defense waste away in prisons for stealing a car or television. While officers of huge corporate organizations preside in posh boardrooms, though it is proven they have manipulated the stock market. Television gives us almost daily reports of defense contract cost overrides, is what it's called, cost overrides, okay, that steal millions of tax dollars. Ours is a society on the take, and stealing is one of the most blatant sins, which seems to be acceptable, and no one blinks, blinks an eye because they're busy stealing as well. Apart from the obvious ways of seeing this commandment broken, we should think of the more subtle ways we break it. Note this, four things. Number one, by not giving our employers a full day of pay, we receive, we are thieves. We are stealing, you are a thief. Number two, by stealing the good name of another with malicious gossip, you have stolen his credibility, you have stolen his integrity, you have stolen his character. You are a thief. Number three, by remaining silent, thus stealing from another the word that might preserve reputation or undergird someone's character, your silence screams, and in your silence you steal, you aid and abet, you become an accomplice to an act of stealing. And number four, by failing to give to others the support, the praise, and the credit they are actually due, you steal from them. Does this become much more clear for you to begin to comprehend and to understand the magnitude of what it means you shall not steal low tignaf? We can clearly see <coughs> how difficult it is for us to acknowledge the truth of our condition. The number one, if I can say it this way, issue that we face today is that the church is blatantly involved. And I talk about the church family is blatantly involved and blatantly involved in stealing absolutely everything from absolutely everyone in one form or another. Welcome back, this is Lecture 11, Part 2, and let's return back to the Eighth Commandment, the sanctity of property, or in the Hebrew, lo tenaf, where we're talking about, you shall not steal, thou shall not steal. And one of the issues that, has, that comes about is the decision that has to be rendered. And we have to look at this in, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. You shall not steal, this is the Eighth Commandment. And what is, the, what is the decision that is demanded by this commandment? Now, so far up until this point, Scripture has been extremely forceful in telling us exactly what not to do. So let's look at that, what not to do. Now, that may seem counterintuitive, and it may be, the, it may be even so basic that it insults the intelligence of one person. Yet... Stealing is so, so common that perhaps it's not so much as common sense or counterintuitive. A, we must never steal, not even once. 
That's, that's plain. You see, if you're going to choose to live by the law, the problem with that is that no one can keep the law. Once you break one commandment, you break all commandments and you're guilty with the full weight of the law upon your person. So we are typically told you shall not steal is very, very clear. B, we must never withhold tithes and offerings from God. Now let's return back to the book of Malachi where we were in our last class and note what he says because we were reading verse 7, 8, 9, chapter 3 of the book of Malachi. And I want to go back there again, but this time I want to look at it in terms of verses 8, 9, and 10 this time. Malachi 3, verse 8, 9, and 10. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in the tithes and the offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Then he says in, in verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Okay? Now I want you to notice what he says here because he says here in verse 10, he says, bring the whole tithes. Okay. And I want you to see this one because this really is an all-inclusive statement. It was not just the 10%. He says the whole tithe, he says, bring it all. And the truth of the matter is that it is rare when you see the believer or the current day, postmodern day believer who wants to live by the law under the tithe, does he ever really do that? So he continues to violate, in fact, what Malachi says to us in chapter 3. Number C, we must never cheat our brother in anything, in anything. Note what he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 6. Cheating is another form of stealing. Note what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 6. He says, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things just as we also told you before the before and solemnly warned you now notice this do not he says let uh, that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger now you understand that you may defraud me or I may defraud you the problem is that if you and I are believers and when the bus business of defrauding one another or other believers is that it is the Lord himself who is the avenger he takes note. You not only are stealing from him, but you steal from God by defrauding your brother because your brother is made in the image of God, part of God's creation, thus part of the person of God. And so when you mistreat another brother, another person, another sister in Christ Jesus, you, mis you mistreat God. And thus you steal from them, you steal from God. D, we must never steal people. The enslavement of people takes away a person's right to his own life. Again, in Exodus chapter 21, verse 6, we read this in Exodus chapter 21, verse 16. We said this a couple of number of classes ago. And note what he says. He who kidnaps a man, he who abducts a man, he who steals a man, in other words, another person, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession shall surely be put to death. So here clearly what we have here, without getting into the nuances of the Jewish Talmud, okay, of the Talmud or the sages or the rabbis of old, I want you to understand that when you take the life of another person, whether you take their life literally or you steal that person physically or you steal from them emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, what you have done is committed the act of stealing thus violating the Eighth Commandment, the sanctity, okay, of what belongs to someone else. It does not belong to you. So he says, he who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, it does not matter. It says, shall surely be put to death. It is a capital crime in the eyes of God. So I want you to note that. So we clearly are told what not to do. Now remember that the sages of old or the rabbis of old said that you could not, th these, will not these would not be actionable causes. In other words, you cannot render a decision against these things if the person had not been forewarned. Now, 
So far, what we have done, at least in these first few minutes, is to clearly identify okay, what you could not do. So that's, thus you are being forewarned. You are told that you must never steal, not even once. You are told that you must never withhold the tithes and the offerings that belong to God. You are told that you must never cheat your brother in anything. And you are told that we must never steal people uh, uh, under any set of circumstances. So now we have been clearly forewarned, thus now we place ourselves in what would be called actionable cause. Okay? Now, the, whatever, whatever the cause is that, that engages you and, cre- and, and, and helps you, aids and abides you, okay? or forces you in your mind and your way of thinking to go and commit this act okay? uh, of treason against God, thus against another person by stealing whatever it is that belongs to them, from them, onto your person. I want you to understand, you have been now warned. Now you step into the realm of actionable cause where now the full weight of the law, the law of God, now bears down upon you. Now, let's look at the second side because this is a two-sided coin. So let's look at this. Scripture is also very forceful in telling us what to do. So far we looked at what not to do, but it's also forceful in what to do. We're told exactly what to do to do. We're told in the courts, in the modern day courts, that ignorance of the law is no excuse. I want you to understand that ignorance of the law truly is no excuse because we've been told what to do. And you go, well, I didn't know that. Well, Scripture also told us in the book of Romans in chapter 12, verse 1, that you and I are responsible for the renewing of our mind. And the only way that can happen is by the Word of God. So note this with me and go to Romans chapter 12, verse 17. A, we must practice the golden rule. What rule is that? That is to be honest. That is to be fair and just with all people. Treat others as we would want them to treat us or as you and I would want to be treated. In Romans chapter 12, verse 17, note what he says. Never pay back evil for to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. I do not have the right for revenge or to take vengeance upon another person. Clearly the scripture tells me here, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Listen to me very carefully. In the, when I take revenge or I avenge myself in paying back evil, okay, for evil, here's what I'm doing. I am now committing the very crime, the very blasphemous act of stealing what does not belong to me. Now, you may have stolen from me, and then I turn around and go back and steal something from you, and in my mind's eye, I think that it's the moral equivalent. It's not. Repaying evil for evil is not the moral equivalent. This is not algebra where we say that whatever happens on the left side of the equation must happen on the right side of the equation. In other words, we say one and one is two. But the fact of the matter is that when you and I engage in evil for evil, one and one is not two, it's 11. And the reason why it's parallel is because it's my act of stealing back from someone else. It does not matter. You need to comprehend that it is still stealing. In Matthew chapter 7, turn your Bibles there and look at me in verse 12. I want you to see this in Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. He says, in everything, now let's stop there, now we have a problem. Because now here in the word of God, Jesus declares, he provides us with a conditional clause. He says, in everything. In what? In what? In everything. So that should, you should now stop and pause for a moment. Because whatever else he's going to say, is going to include everything. You need to get that. You need to understand that. Stop reading the word of God so fast as though it was the newspaper. Slow down. Look at what he says. He says in everything. And in my Bible, it says there's a comma right after that. So now that comma is going to link whatever's going to come after that. And look what he says. In everything... He says, therefore, now we're told, we're being set up, that something has to happen. So he says, in everything, therefore, he says, treat 
people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. For this is the law and the prophets. It does not matter that another person may be mistreating me. I'm going to treat them the way I want them to treat me in spite of the fact that at the moment they're not treating me that way. Why? Because um, it makes them right and me wrong? No, because it makes me right in the eyes of God to give him honor and glory that in spite of the fact that I'm being mistreated, I'm going to treat that person correctly. I am not responsible for that other person's response or their reaction. I am not responsible for what they do or do not do. I'm only responsible for what's within the realm of my sphere of influence, which is me. This is the only person I can control. So when I mistreat someone else, okay, I steal from them the dignity that is due to them in spite of the fact that they may, they may not be dignified in their treatment of my person or in their language or in their actions. They're still made in the image of God. B, we must love our neighbor as ourselves. And now you have to admit that some of us don't have, some of us don't have the choicest of neighbors. Would you agree with that? Okay. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have the choicest of neighbors. And I've had one in particular that now has, now in the last several years, has actually spent time to talk to me, speak with me, engage me, who for many, many, many years before that would not do so because he had, a, had, a, he had, had a problem with a quote unquote another Christian who had lived in that house before we moved into it okay, and felt that he had been highly offended by that other Christian. And so he held that grudge, he held that ill will, that feeling toward anyone who claimed to be a Christian, and worse yet was when he found out that I was a pastor. And for many, many years he would not engage me, but I would always, I always said hello to him, always treated him right, didn't matter. Okay? I understood what his position was, but I didn't even have to understand that position. I just needed to understand what God's position, position was, and that was for me to treat him right. Now, in Matthew chapter 22, I want you to note this with me. And look, let's look together in verse 36, 37, 38, and 39. In Matthew chapter 22, and note what Jesus actually says. Teacher. What is the great commandment in the law is the question that is being presented to him. Now, I want you to note this. He, they're asking which is the great commandment or which is the greatest commandment. That's what I want, you to, I want to draw your attention to. And he said in verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So now he responds very specifically here. And then he says this is the great and the foremost commandment. And then he says, there's a second commandment. He says, it's like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, notice this. He does not qualify who that neighbor is. He does not say that your neighbor is necessarily Jewish, who's necessarily a Christian, necessarily a believer, necessarily somebody whom you agree with, and so forth and so forth. He does not say that. Okay? He says, love your neighbor, period. He doesn't qualify them. Now, I want you to think about it for a moment. If God does not qualify them, let me ask you a question. Where do you and I get the idea that we can qualify them? If God chooses not to qualify, how is it that we choose to qualify? Because the moment you qualify, let me tell you what you're doing. You're stealing from the great commandment to love him as yourself. See. We must be temperate, controlled in all things. Now, I realize that that can be difficult at times. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, look with me in verse 25. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 says this. Everyone who competes in the games exercises what? 
himself control in all things. He didn't say in some things. He didn't say in the things that, 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 that gratify you, things that bring you pleasure, things that you like, things that you approve. He didn't say that. He said in all things, they then do it to receive a perishable wealth, but weak and imperishable one. So we must find ourselves temperate and controlled in all things because when we do not do that, we then steal the dignity of another person person and you don't realize it but you steal from yourself you steal the imperishable okay and convert it into the perishable d we must learn to be content with what we have and learn that we brought nothing into this world and we can carry nothing out that perhaps is one of the most difficult things to try to communicate and particularly in a culture like ours where our culture is about obtaining things upon things upon things upon things upon things and you need to comprehend that. You need to be content. You realize when you're not content, you're a thief. You are a thief when you're not content. You want more. Now notice this. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, note what the scripture says to us. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, I want you to see this with me. And particularly, I want you to see it in verse 7 and 8. Look what he says. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. We brought nothing in, so we're not taking anything out. So why do we spend a lifetime hanging on to something that, A, we didn't bring in, and B, we're not taking with us? B, you see, you see, you you rob, you steal the contentment that God has placed into your life, okay, and replace it, okay, with something else, and usually it's with something that is perishable. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, we're also told this. In Hebrews 13, 5, he says, make sure that your character is free from what? From the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never forsake you. I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So, when you are not free from the love of money, you will steal, you will rob, you will engage in all kinds of deceptive practices where you will be, you will leave people delusional because you will deceive them because you're seeking to have what they have. E, we must channel our desires toward eternal heavenly treasures, not toward the temporary things of the earth. We're told in the book of Colossians in chapter 3 and verse 2, set your mind on the things above and not on the things that are on the earth. As long as your mind is on the earth, let me tell you something, you steal your mind away from God. That is blasphemous. In F, point F, we must quit stealing and go to work. We must even go work long and hard in order to earn more so that we can earn enough to help others. Work is not just about providing for your four and no more. Look what he says in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 28. He who steals must steal what? No longer. And then no, now, he, now he provides a condition here. He says, but rather he must labor, must work, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has no need. So you and I are responsible for sharing with others who have need and that's one of the biggest purposes of why we work. Point G, we must realize this astounding truth that we must measure to others, we, what we measure to others will be measured back to us. We're told in the book of Luke in chapter 6 and verse 38, give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. So when you steal, trust me something, you will be stolen from. H, we must learn the phenomenal, unbelievable promise of God that we are not to get things by stealing, but by do it by prayer and hard work. We're told in James chapter 4, verse 2, James chapter 4, verse 2, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. So obviously, those who constantly in the act of stealing obviously don't have a prayer life whatsoever. 
AI, we must learn to work hard and trust God for the necessities of life. Stealing shows that we fail to trust God and his care for us. And that's very clear. Matthew 6, says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. When you don't do that, you steal from God. In Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, it says this, For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. No such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now such persons we command, he says, to work in quiet fashion, eat their own bread. Stop, stop being a, a, a leech on other people. J, we must realize that stealing is a terrible sin. The thief shall face the terrifying judgment and the condemnation of God. We're told in the book of Matthew in chapter 7 again, go back with me and look at verse 21, 22, and 23, says this. Not everyone who says to me, <clears throat> Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter, and many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did not we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many, many miracles? And, from, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, who practiced lawlessness. Can you imagine in the end discovering you have been left out completely? Now, we must realize that stealing is a terrible sin and stealing causes the loss for the victim, perhaps something frivolous, whether it be jewelry or television, a stereo set, so forth, or perhaps something he needs, whether it's money, food, or even his life. All because the thief acted on a desire of which you, does have, you do not have a right to own.